we will move ahead to our next session and I would like, um, which is our Bhagavatam call. It will be uh, provided, our today's Bhagavatam lecture will be provided by His Holiness, Chand uh, His Holiness Chandramuli Swami Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories at your lotus feet, Maharaj. All glories to Sri Prabhupada and to you. Thank you very much. Uh, for joining the call. Prabhuji will enlighten us on the verse uh, from Canto 5th, chapter 6, verse number 3. I don't think Jifani Mataji will give the introduction today. Maybe Maharaj will take over the call directly. Hare Krishna. Okay. Om Agyan Timiran Dasya Gidajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gondavani Pacharine Nivisheshwa Shunyavari Pasyat Yade Sitarine Pancha kalpa through this chapipa, Sindhu bay, which are petitan, um, bavane bill, Vaishnave bill, and the home maha. Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhunitananda, Sri Advaita Gadahar, Srivasadi Gaur, Bhaktarinda, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. <coughs> Srimad Bhagavata, <clears throat> fifth canto, chapter six, verse number three, which is a series of verses which begin here and continue to verse number six. The topic is the mind. So we'll begin the Takotam. Nakurya karhi chid sakyam manasi yanavastite yad vishram bach chiraj chirnam kaskanda tapa aishvaram. Translation All the learned scholars have given their opinion. The mind is by nature very restless, and one should not make friends with it. If we place full confidence in the mind, it may cheat us at any moment. Even Lord Shiva became agitated upon seeing the Mohini Morni, Mohini form of Lord Krishna. And Shobari Muni also fell down from the mature stage of yoga perfection. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada's purport. The first business of one trying to advance in spiritual life is to control the mind and senses. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 15.7, Mamai Vam So Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatanaha Manas Satsta Indriyani Prakriti Stani Karshati. Although the living entities are parts and parcel of the Supreme Lord and are therefore in a transcendental position, they are still suffering in the material world and struggling for existence due to the mind and the senses. To get out of this false struggle for existence and become happy in the material world, one has to control the mind and senses and be detached from material conditions. One should never neglect austerities and penances. One should always perform them. Lord Rishabhadev personally showed us how to do this. In the Srimad Bhagavatam 9, 19, 17, it is specifically stated, Matra Swashra Vrihitra Vav Navi Rakta Sano Bhavet Balava Indriyan Nigramo Vidvasam Api Karshiti Nigrihasta Vanaprasta Sanyas and Brahmachari should be very careful when associating with women. One is forbidden to sit down in the solitary place, even with one's mother, sister, or daughter. In our Krishna conscious movement, it has been very difficult to disassociate ourselves from women in our society, especially in Western countries. We are therefore sometimes criticized, but nonetheless, we are trying to give everyone a chance to chant 
the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and thus advance spiritually. If we stick to the principle of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra offenselessly, then by the grace of Srila Haridas Thakur, we may be saved from the allurement of women. However, if we are not very strict in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we may at any time fall victim to women. Is there more? Is that the end? I can't see the end. Yeah. Okay. Om Gyan. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaudavani Pacharine Nirse Sasunyavadi Pastyat Yere Sutarine. We're here. We're getting a little indication of the nature of the mind. <laughs> Krishna explains in another part that the mind is called chanchala. Chanchala means restless or flickering. It is very difficult. In fact, it takes much determination and practice to focus the mind because the mind itself is by nature chanchala or flickering, moving. It's a moving element that constantly moves. Sometimes the mind is considered to be like fluid. Just as liquid is fluid, it keeps moving. So the mind also is very fluid in its, when we try to focus it or control it. Therefore, it takes great practice and determination. And if one does not control the mind, as mentioned here, one can be victimized by the material attractions and attachments. In other words, it'll cause one to detach, not detach, but deter oneself from the process of Krishna consciousness. The material energy presents so many allurements and these allurements come in various forms. And here we're seeing the allurement of what is called woman. So here it's interesting because we have to clarify this statement because the word woman in scripture refers not to female, but it refers to the opposite sex. So this is important to understand that woman Man, for woman, man is woman, and for man, woman is woman. So the word woman refers to the opposite sex. That is the Vedic presentation and meaning of the word woman. So not to get confused by the language and to understand it in its proper sense. So in this world, the opposite sex becomes very attractive. Even if one is married, even if one has a very nice relationship with their husband or wife or any, still there is always this flickering mind that gets attracted to the opposite sex. So it's just the nature of this material world. But if one is not very careful to control it and the mind is, uh, something that is not very easily controlled. The mind is part of the subtle body and the mind is made up of two categories, what is called conscious awareness and unconscious knowledge or unconscious information. What that means is that uh, on the waking stage, we are aware of what we're doing and what we're thinking at the time. But inside the collective consciousness, there is a whole gamut or a whole bastion, a whole, uh, what we say, uh, array of various thoughts, desires, impressions that have come with the mind. Because when the living entity leaves the body and takes on another body, the mind carries us the soul to the next body. So we have the same mind, which we have always had since we have hit the material energy. So that mind is the same and therefore it is collecting impressions, desires, experiences, 
in material life. And these things remain in the subconscious. So at any time, the mind can cheat you. At any time, the mind can bring up something from the unconscious, which is triggered by the external environment. Sometimes it's triggered by the external environment. And sometimes it comes up just because that desire is very prominent. It may be either one. When we see a particular situation or we're in a particular way, situation, the mind will react in a certain way. And it may be a variety as a reaction, but it's based on its own desires and understanding. The mind itself is more like a mirror. This is a very, very good description because when we hear Lord Chaitanya speak about the mind, he says, Chaito Darpanam Marginum. Chaita refers to mind. Darpanam refers to uh, Mira. And uh, Marginum refers to clean, cleansing. So therefore the mind is like a reflecting element. Whatever's inside will be reflected on the external environment. That's why it says, no two people see the external energy in the exact same way. There may be similars, similarities, but because each of our minds are impressioned in a different way, that external experience will be seen differently. <laughs> so therefore, one should understand that one is dealing with something that is very strong and very prominent. <laughs> so we work with the mind, but we have to make sure the mind doesn't control us. So who are us? Us is the soul, but how do you control the mind? You control the mind by the intelligence, which is a feature of the mind also, but it's the discriminating feature of the mind which allows you to choose or to understand or contemplate how to act, how to think, how to react, or how to analyze. So the intelligence is our friend when it's connected to higher knowledge. What is that higher knowledge? That higher knowledge is Guru Sadhu Shastra. Guru, the words of the spiritual master. Sadhu, the life of the great souls who have gone before us. And Shastra means the words of Krishna coming through the pages of the Vedic knowledge, Vedic literatures. <clears throat> so this is, the, this is how we connect the intelligence to higher knowledge and use that higher understanding to apply each, uh, to apply how to react and act in each and every situation. If we allow the mind <clears throat> to act independently without having either a controlled intelligence or a weak intelligence, if the intelligence is weak, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> If the intelligence is weak, it will overshadow, the mind will overshadow the intelligence and therefore one is on the mental platform. On the mental platform, there is constant accepting and rejecting based on like and dislike. That's the nature of the mind. The mind accepts and rejects based on whether I like it or don't like it, like that. It's called, uh, Sankalpa Vikalpa, accepting and rejecting. Now we can accept them and reject also using the intelligence when the intelligence is geared or connected to higher knowledge, then this is called Shastra Chakshush. That means seeing through scripture, seeing through uh, authority, seeing through knowledge, and not simply seeing through uh, uh, our experience with this naked eye. What do we see with the eye or the, the mind? We see what we want to see. Basically, that's it. Therefore, we don't see anything. 
or we don't see very little, we see very little. It's like when you see another person, you may think in a certain way, but behind that body you're seeing is the soul, which is the actual person. We never see the person. We're seeing the body they have, but we don't see the person. But we should know through knowledge that that person, that not that individual who has a body is a spiritual being. And in the heart of that spiritual being, there is the, as Krishna is there is also. So that is seeing through knowledge. Vidya Vinaya Sampane, Brahmani Gavi Hastini, Suni Chaiva Swapake Chan, Pandita Samadarshanaha, Samadarsha. That means to see equally, or see with equal vision. So that means seeing the soul beyond the external forms that appear in this world. We deal with the external forms, but we know behind it is the movement of the external forms is fueled by the presence of the soul and the super soul combined. So that is seeing in with, with knowledge. Therefore, one has to practice <clears throat> controlling the mind. So let's get into that subject a little bit, how to deal with this restless mind, because we all have a mind. Um, we have the statement from Prahlad Maharaj, who was uh, responding to his father, Rani Kashipu, <clears throat> when <coughs> Rani Kashipu had discovered his son was a devotee of Lord Vishnu. He became quite angry and upset and started to chastise him in so many ways. And one of the things he said is, you are taking the side of my enemy. Uh, Harani Kashipu had made Vishnu his enemy and therefore he accused his son of siding with his enemy. Prahlad Maharaj, although a five-year boy, 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 he was self-realized in full transcendental knowledge. So he said to his father in response, my dear father, the only enemy is your own mind. <laughs> And this is, this is a general statement. It doesn't simply apply to Harani Kashipu. The mind, as Krishna says in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, is the friend of the living entity and his enemy as well. One should elevate themselves by the nine and not degrade themselves. The mind is the friend of the conditioned souls and its enemy as well. One who controls the mind, the mind is the best of friends. One who fails to do so, his very mind becomes his greatest enemy, not just enemy, greatest enemy. So external enemies are simply an experience that the mind has created. External friends are this experience that the mind has created. The mind creates everything based on our, our uh, uh, experiences in this world and combined with our, our uh, experiences and impressions and desires from previous lives. All these things mixed together. That's why it's such a complex uh, network of thoughts, desires, impressions that experience, that will play itself out in so many different ways that one can never understand the mind. <laughs> and one should not try to understand it. One should try to control it. Now, there are three ways to control the mind. And uh, I'll mention these three ways. One is to keep oneself connected to the instructions of the spiritual master. In other words, remembering the spiritual master's instructions in each and every waking moment. And that way we can apply that knowledge in a practical sense in everything we do. And then the mind is con connected on the spirit on the spiritual platform. Another way to control the mind, and and as Srila Prabhupada said, is the best way, is to fully engage it in devotional service. Then the mind is fully on the spiritual platform, and it is controlled, <laughs> and the senses follow the mind because the mind is the king of all senses. 
It's called the monarch of the senses. <clears throat> now, the third way, this is a little less spiritual, but it also has an, a certain effect. When one works for the benefit of others, when one focuses their attention on how to do good to others, using the intelligence directed in the, the mind, using the mind directed by the intelligence on how to help others in life by doing various services and providing different situations for other people. Sometimes we call those people do-gooders, but it's a way to control the mind, just working for the welfare of others constantly, not just simply when we feel like it. When we feel like it, but no, constantly. So these are the three ways to control the mind. Now to control the mind, it's not very easy to get it to the stage of control. And so there's some techniques that are suggested, which are very practical and very uh, successful. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and Srila Prabhupada repeats this, that when one gets up in the morning, one should beat the mind with shoes. Okay? And when, before one takes rest at night, one should beat the mind with a broomstick. Okay? So, you might think, is that literal? <laughs> it can be. I've seen devotees do it. And Prabhupada, when he would say this, I, he said, I keep a pair of shoes with me any, in case any of my disciples need it. <laughs> So, but the point is that these are the two times of the day, especially where the mind becomes the most hardest to control. And therefore one has to immediately connect that mind to higher knowledge or something transcendental, something spiritual. And don't, the more one allows the mind to wander, the harder it becomes to control when it's time to control it. That's why those who are expert at controlling the mind, they do it 24 seven, not just when it appears to be needed. And then the rest of the time, they just let it go wherever it wants. No, that's dangerous because it may go into places that are quite innocent, but then again, because the mind is wandering, it'll go to other places which are not so innocent. And we might find ourselves in a very difficult mental state. And sometimes these, strong, these, negativity, these negative thoughts become so strong, you can't get them out of your mind, even when you try it. Especially when you see certain uh, images in the environment. If some image, the more stronger the emotional impression that the image gives, the harder it is to get that out of your mind. That's why love is the strongest emotional impression. So when you're in love, when you're feeling that mood of love, you're thinking always in that way. It becomes so strong. It's constantly with you. So, but in the same way, anger is also a very strong emotion. So if that takes over, then it becomes very difficult to restrict that, to control that. And so and to eliminate it also. So one has to be very diligent, and that's the word. It's not just serious. We have to be very diligent to keep the mind and senses directed in the right way. There's a lot that we can say on this topic because it is such a broad topic, uh, the mind and how it works. We should always remember to detach ourselves from the activities of the mind. We are not this body. We hear this over and over again in the scriptures, but the mind is a part of the subtle body. So that includes the mind also. We are not the mind. The impressions, the desires, the idiosyncrasies, the uh, experiences that are situated within the mind are all external. Or, to our actual existence. 
they come and they go because they are part of the material energy which is always moving like that. So therefore the best way to control the mind is to is to seriously and very carefully can chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra with attention and with determination and ultimately with bhakti, with devotion. If we practice very seriously chanting our rounds in the morning, that means no cell phones. When you get up, you may use your cell phones for something but then again, if you decide to keep it on during your japa, you're going to get messages. It's going to remind you of things you need to do and people you need to call. And somebody calls you, take it, hit the hit the off button, and then begin your chanting. Otherwise, if you're interfered with or interrupted in your chanting, it makes it difficult to can keep the mind focused on the holy name like that. So we have to practice that. So this is the austerity, as Prabhupada said here, he makes this point. Uh, where is it? He says, uh, one should never neglect austerities and penances. Yeah. One should always perform them. So that's part of that beginning of the purport. So austerities help to control the mind. Penances also are vows to do things and to avoid things. So these two things, austerities and penances, make the mind strong and help to develop detachment. Otherwise, the mind will rule you. If you're ruled by the mind, you're nowhere. <laughs> And it can cause you great amounts of anxiety. When you're happy, you're happy. When you're miserable, you're miserable. It's the same mind. It can take you up or it can take you down. And all these experiences are part of the illusionary energy. That's why Prabhupada says here, the, the due to the the suffering in this material world and struggle for existence is due to the mind and the senses to get out of this false struggle for existence. So you note that word false. We're struggling unnecessarily to become happy in this world. There's no need to struggle. All one has to do is direct the mind and the senses towards Krishna and devotional service. And that requires general practice. Another point that we can use to help us deal with the, the restless mind is mentioned in the, um, if you have a moment, can you put up this verse from the, it's, it's also from the, uh, it's from the fifth canto. It's the 11th chapter, 5.11.17, which is the last chapter, I believe, in the, in the, uh, yeah. So here Prabhupada says, the, uh, this uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. If one neglects it or gives it a chance, it will grow more and more powerful and become victorious. Now here, although it is not factual, in other words, it's creative, it is very strong. It covers the constitutional position of the soul. Now, King uh, uh King Rahugana is the king here, and Maharaj Jadbar is speaking to him. He says, Oh, king, please try to conquer this mind by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and the supreme personality of Godhead. Do this with great care. Now, there's one interesting and very powerful statement that comes at right at the beginning of the purport. Prabhupada says, there is one easy way with which the mind can be conquered, neglect. <laughs> one word, neglect. The mind is always telling us to do this or that. Therefore, we should be very expert in disobeying the mind's orders. Gradually, the mind should be trained to obey the orders of the soul. It is not that one should obey the orders of the mind. And then here we get the example of Bhakti Siddhanta with the beating the shoes in the morning 
and again beating the, the, the beating the mind in the morning with shoes and broomstick at night. Mm -hmm. So in this they say this one way one can control the mind. So Prabhupada ends, if one abides by the orders of the spiritual master, by the grace of Krishna, he is freed from service to the mind. So this is a very, this is the essential point of life, keeping that mind going in the direction that is beneficial for the soul, beneficial for the living entity's progress towards eternal life. And we have, we are all impressioned people. We have so many karmic uh, impressions that are due to our sojourn in this material world, life after life. These things don't go away so easy. And they may, came out, they may come out in our waking interaction with other people, or they may also come out in dreams and like that. But one should always be careful to make sure the mind and senses are controlled. Otherwise, a little deviation, as Prabhupada mentions in the original verse that we were talking about, Sumara, Subari Muni was meditating underwater and he saw, he was a great yogi, yogi. he saw two fish engaged in copulation and he became agitated just watching the fish so much so he gave up his yoga practice and decided to seek out a married partner and there's a whole story it's mentioned in the ninth canto yeah 9917 it's mentioned in that ninth canto the story of subari muni so we can learn from the example of the great souls and I know before ending the class, I'd also like to mention to show you by example that um, we have the example, and then Prabhupada uses it, or I'm sorry, not Prabhupada, but the, the uh, translation, even Lord Shiva became agitated upon seeing the Mohini form of Lord Krishna. And then we also have the example where Lord Brahma, he chased after his own daughter for, <clears throat> for sex life. <clears throat> so Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, powerful controllers. Now, Prabhupada said, they're okay. We shouldn't find any fault with them. But what, what are they doing? They're teaching by their own example. Even I can become bewildered. What to speak of you? <laughs> In other words, they're using themselves as an example to teach the world how difficult and how powerful the, uh, the, the, the material energy is, especially in the form of attraction for the opposite sex. Sometimes a man will go for another person's wife knowing that he's risking his life doing that but he can't resist because he is attracted. He's attached. His mind is driving him in that direction. So these are examples of how powerful this mind can be. A thief, <clears throat> he knows I've been, I've, been, I've been stealing. I've been caught. I've been put into prison. Now I'm out. And he's thinking of stealing again. Mm -hmm because he can't give up that desire it's so strong and the mind makes these desires seem like that it will rationalize anything <laughs> the mind will rationalize anything even the most ridiculous and uh, inane activities the mind can rationalize that so therefore we should very carefully understand and study I would suggest the devotees study the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna talks about Dhyana Yoga. And this is the, the whole chapter is about the mind. And Krishna speaks so many relevant and important points. 
And then I'll end with one statement, which is an interaction by, um, maybe we can go to that verse. It's in the Bhagavad Gita, um, sixth chapter, verse number 34, I believe it is. 634. Uh, yeah, this is it. Chanchala Himana Krishna Pramiti Balabhadraha Tashyaham Nigaman Manya Dvayarida Saduskraham. Now Arjuna is speaking. The mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, and very strong, O Krishna. And to subdue it, I think it is more difficult than controlling the wind. Now go to the next verse, Krishna responds. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Asam Saya Mahabaho Mano Durni Gunam Chalam Abhyasena Tukontaya Vairagena Chagriyate. Lord Krishna said, O Mani Armed Son of Kunti, it is undoubtedly very difficult to curb the restless mind, but it is possible by suitable practice and detachment. So these are two things. Suitable practice means Krishna consciousness, and detachment means to get, uh, perform austerities, which detached ourselves from the attraction of the material world. <clears throat> and there's various types of austerities one can practice. Okay, so this is a little bit, you'll be, uh, you'll be reviewing this subject for the next three more verses, verse four, five, and six, and it gets even more, more, um, uh, what's the word? <laughs> trying to think. It gets more and more into the more finer entanglements of how the mind can, uh, you know, carry the soul into places where you don't really want to go. <laughs> so uh, if we can learn this subject very carefully, how to control the mind and senses and how to direct it, then you can make nice progress on the path of spiritual life. But then again, now on this particular verse that we spoke on today, Srila Prabhupada also gave a lecture on this verse. And it's also recorded in the database. And he said, one should never trust the mind, always distrust. And then he clarifies that. He said, this is the word of, words of the previous spiritual teachers. They tell us, never trust your mind. Always distrust, because it can cheat you at any time. So always be careful to keep that mind controlled by the higher intelligence and connect the higher intelligence with the words of spiritual master, the words of Krishna, and with the teachings of the great souls from the past. So the formula is there, but the mind will never listen. It takes sometimes a whole lifetime to control the mind. But if you practice, as Krishna says, practice and detachment. Okay, we'll stop there and see if there is some Discussion or questions? Haribol Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and to all our Guru Maharajas. Thank you so much for the wonderful in-depth class, Prabhuji. It is one of the most hardest thing to do, controlling the mind. And we, we feel so helpless. And we fail, fail, fail all the time. I mean, we understand the distance between sometimes, not always, between the body and the soul. But it's so difficult. We, I mean, we know that we have to neglect the mind. But to apply that, but because we are constantly with the mind and we think that we are thinking intelligently, we think that... We have the Shastra Chakshu, but we're again interpreting it with our mind, you know, so, and uh, to apply it. But thank you for the formula. Thank you always for re-emphasizing it, Maharaj. It is so important. And you gave us mm -hmm. such practical tips. 
And just to chant in the morning, keep your cell phones off, keep it far, keep it distant, don't touch it, practice it twice. So when they say beat your mind or neglect your mind, I'm assuming to create a distance between the soul and the mind and the way to create the distant and to not fall into the trap is the only way is to practice Krishna consciousness is to japa doing his holy name and doing service yeah. and devotees. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But that takes practice. In the meantime, we should also keep that mind from wandering where it shouldn't go. <laughs> and the, the more you practice controlling it, the, the more, it, at first it becomes difficult. We use the hmm. example um, you have a lion in a cage. And so if you decide not to feed it for one day, then the lion will start roaring and he'll want food. It'll become a little bit agitated. So if you don't feed it for the second day, then it becomes even more uh, ferocious, more agitated. But if you continue... To, to not defeat it, then after the while, the, 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 the lion loses its, its energy and just gives up. So in the same way, we have to stop feeding the mind with the wrong things and then gradually introduce the right things. Right. Thank you. Yes, Maharaj. It's the distinction between the right and the wrong that would come from the intelligence and keep feeding the right things to the yeah, mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's know? mentioned in the Shastras. Yes. And that's called Anukulena and Pratikul. Pratikul, yes, Maharaj. Yeah, Pratikul means things to avoid. Anukulena means things to accept. Mm -hmm. So one has to know the distinction and therefore accept and reject based on knowledge not on sentiment or what we say, moment experience. Mm. So if we learn to practice some of the techniques for mind control, and there are, then you can gradually start to see how it works and how to keep it focused, at least move it in the, right, in a, in, in the direction you want it to go. So sometimes, Maharaj, I don't know if you have anything to say, as you were saying, anger. So generally it's not there, but sometimes, for example, towards our own children, um, we try to do the best that they, they're probably kids and we understand that, yet sometimes hurtful things come out and which we regret later. So this constant struggle, being able to understand, however, not being able to apply it during the right time. Any? Yeah, Raja, what is it? Kama Esha Krota Esha, Raja yes, Guna Simu Baha, Mahasha no Mahapapam, Vidyeha Viharvarinam. Kama Esha Krota Esha, yeah, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, it is lust and lust only come in contact with the material modes of passion, which is later transformed into wrath, which is the all devouring sinful enemy of this world. So yeah, lust means material desire. So when if we have a material desire and we are trying to fulfill that desire and we can't, we become angry. And the intensity of that, that attachment to that desire will bring that anger in the same proportion. So sometimes people do the most craziest things when they get angry. And then after that, it's regrettable, but it's too late. <laughs> So therefore, we have to practice detachment. If we don't practice detachment, then uh, when things come in our purview that we are attached to, we try to fulfill them. And sometimes that's good, and sometimes it's not. Therefore, we're, therefore, we have to use the intelligence to discriminate. So we learn from our experience. If we make some mistake previously, and then we see ourselves in the same situation again. Then we can we can see what was the results from our previous experience and try to avoid that. And if it was good results, then we try to push that same 
same uh, way. But if it's not, then we, we say, oh, I made that mistake before, I'm not going to do it again. So remembering our past experiences helps to give us an understanding how to act in the present. Right, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your nectarian words, thoughtful, in-depth analysis. Uh, many pronounce at your humble feet, Maharaj. Devotees, if there are any questions, we may ask Maharaj now. Um, yes, Amaldeep um, Prabhuji, if you would like to go ahead and ask the question. Hare Krishna, Swamiji. Did not pronounce. It was a very good lecture and I learned a lot of new things. Uh, but I have only one question. You said that the mind is the uh, car and the intelligence is the driver of, of it. So how can we differentiate mind and intelligence from the soul? How to see them separately? Mm. Like well, after that, death, the yeah. mind and intelligence goes with the soul or not? Well, the, the characteristics of the mind are explained and the characteristics of the soul are explained. I mean, the intelligence are explained. So the mind is, <clears throat> is uh, thinking, feeling, willing. These are the three features of the mind. The mind thinks, gets a feel for something, and then it wills accordingly. The intelligence is determination and discrimination. And these are the two facets of the mind. To drive us in a certain direction, and to discriminate in which way we want to act or not act like that. So um, I use a very really simple example, but maybe we have some experience, how the mind and the intelligence are different. Example, maybe we have this experience, maybe we don't. I know I've had. You're up high on the top of a building and you're looking down and the mind says, jump. And the intelligence says, no. So the mind jumps in there, doesn't have any discrimination and just sees the situation and makes some stupid statement, which has nothing to do with any value at all. But it'll say, you know, jump. Or sometimes the mind will say, say something nasty to this person where intelligence will say, no, don't. So this is how you can distinguish between the activities of the mind and intelligence. One is dictating and the other one is observing and then discriminating like that. And if the intelligence is like the mind, then you're in trouble. Then they both take you to hell. Now the soul is neutral. The soul doesn't touch the material energy either on the subtle or gross form. So the soul, the soul is being dragged. You'll see that picture in the Bhagavad Gita, which is a very, very good image of how things are working. You see the chariot and you see the five horses drawing the chariot. You see the chariot driver and then you see the passenger. Okay. So the, four, the five horses are the five senses. The chariot reins, which control are the, is the mind. The driver is the, in, the intelligence. The passenger is the soul. And the chariot is the body. If you look at that, you can see the whole thing. So the, the soul is the passenger. It's being dragged by the mind and the senses, guided by the intelligence. Yeah. There is, that's the image there. You can see each of the horses are the senses. The reins are the mind. Intelligence is the driver and the soul is sitting in the back. And the chariot itself is the body. <laughs> nice image. <laughs> so Swamiji, we basically we have to use our um, intelligence uh, to basically uh, enhance our um, soul uh, could, you you both, uh, could you repeat so that? I, understood, I understood that we have to use both our uh, mind and intelligence in a proper way so that we can give benefit to our soul 
after Exa the, exactly uh, after yeah you connect you connect your intelligence with higher knowledge and then gradually the mind also adopts that like that the mind like is in the, mode, the, the mind's in the mode of goodness and the intelligence is in the mode of passion the false ego is in the mode of ignorance so the mind and like the fault the mind and the false ego work together to drag the living entity this way and that way so when the mind listens to the false ego which is in the mode of ignorance then the mind although in the mode of goodness is dragged into the mode of ignorance also Intelligence is the mode of passion, which is the discriminating feature. So, like after uh, when a person dies, that after, in every birth, his uh, the body changes and the mind changes and the intelligence changes, but the soul remains the same. No, you carry the same mind and intelligence from one life to another. It's not like it changes. It just you're carrying when you when we leave the body in this particular life we are in uh, the, the mind and carries the soul to the next body that's how that's transmigration based on the impressions of the mind you get a new body that's why everybody gets a different body according to their mental impression at the time of death in the previous life so you got the same mind, you got the same intelligence that you had life after life after life, but you're just compounding the experiences each time you each time you take birth. You're just adding to your experiences in the material world. That's all. Yes, Swamiji. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. I'm Rudev Prabhuji. Thank you, Maharaj, for such an in-depth analysis. It's very fruitful for all of us. Um, Gauri Sevika Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question, please? Thank you so much, Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Maharaji Pranam. Thank you so much for this enlightening session. Uh, Maharaji, when you were explaining the verse from 5, 11, 17, uh, suddenly you came across this sentence like uh, about karmic impressions and you said that it can come during actual interactions with people or in the form of dreams and then there was some other point and we went there so could you please elaborate in on what context you were trying to uh, describe about the karmic impressions um well karmic impressions will arise in different situations yeah based on the external environment it's triggered by the external environment. You see something, you experience something, and therefore you act and react accordingly. And uh, Maharaji, when uh, you explained about the advice that Prabhupada gave regarding neglecting the mind and making it habituated uh, to being obedient to the intelligence, how do we do that practically? Like, do we have to make any journal and start practicing it every day? Or like, how do we do that so that we don't forget that we have yeah. to take Yeah, 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 you have to remember the instructions of the, of the great souls. Remember Krishna's instructions. Remember Srila Prabhupada's instructions. Remember your spiritual master's instructions. The, all those instructions are in the books, they're in the lectures, they're in their, our personal experiences. How to apply the, the knowledge in each and every situation. But generally, if we're engaged in devotional service, you're absorbed in doing the service. So if you're absorbed in doing your service, your mind and senses are controlled. Now, say you're doing, say you're cooking and your mind and senses are focused on cooking. But then something comes up into your mind while you're cooking that has nothing to do with what you're doing. And then you just think, well, you have to see, oh, why is that coming up? So it came up, so what do you do? Well, if I think about this, then I might you know, make a mistake in my cooking, it's taken away from my attention and my cooking. So then you reject it. So using the discriminating factor according to what situation you're in, you accepts things or reject things. But like we mentioned, there's three ways to control the mind. Absorb yourself in devotional activities or absorb yourself in remembering the instructions of the spiritual master in each and every 
situation. And if you don't know those instructions, then you might be, you know, find yourself in uh, a situation where you become confused or defeated or bewildered. So the spiritual master comes and what does he do? He gives knowledge. He gives knowledge and practical guidance. If we don't take advantage of that, then how will we ever, you know, uh, break our cycle of material attachments, which keeps us life after life in this material world. It's important to know the instructions of the spiritual master. That means read the books. That means hear the lectures. That means go to the classes. Uh, and Maharaj, one more thing. Uh, some You were answering the previous question and, and you said about uh, transmigration of body according to the consciousness. So I heard so many people talking about Garud Puran and the basic concept that they give is that even if one has practiced um, spirituality during the old age, but if majority of life he has had so many material attachments, then, oh, then all the senses get uh, frozen one by one. And then there is like a flashback of all the attachments. And it's like a video that plays in the mind for five minutes about the whole life. And then even if we want, we cannot remember Krishna if we were uh, attached to material sense enjoyment throughout majority of the life. So is that true? Because Krishna says that uh, the end matters, like if the yeah. consciousness. Yam yam vapis param bhavam takto ante galerum tam tam evaiti konte yasadata bhava bhavitaha. Krishna says, whatever you remember at the time of death, that's where your destination will be. So if you remember Krishna, you'll go to Krishna. But the impressions that we have through our whole life formulate our consciousness in a collective way. Therefore, the intensity that we have practiced our Krishna consciousness will make a difference. So it's never too late. It's not because our early life was somewhat, you know, sensual or material. It doesn't mean now that it's because, well, I'm older now, it's too late. No, it's never too late. But you might have to work at it <laughs> to overcome it. And Krishna is very merciful. If a devotee is sincerely trying to remember him and has tried their best to serve Krishna, and Krishna will help. He'll be there. He'll make a difference. And Maharaji, what for materialistic people or who are not that sincere? Is it true that forcefully our senses are seized and then we are shown a video clip or like kind of, of whatever... Yeah. A yeah, major consciousness. Yeah, that video clip is to show you all your attachments. <laughs> yeah, so like and, we cannot and, even think at the time of you, death. Yeah, whatever you put your your thought during that video clip, then that becomes your last consciousness. Yeah, okay, but that doesn't you. that doesn't necessarily mean for devotees. That means for the materialists. Devotees may also get tested, but the tests are different. Mm -hmm. The, the, the non-devotees are on their own. They have to fight it out themselves. But the devotees have Krishna there to help them. Thank you so much, Maharaji, for clearing my doubts. Hare Krishna. Krishna wants us to go back home to Godhead more than we want to go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. We all have this hidden fear between us, as you were telling to Mataji. Like, will we be able to pass the exam, the final exam or not? This is a big worry of all the devotees. Thank you, Maharaj, for your explanation. Sri Devi Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your questions? Thank you. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. Thank you for this wonderful class on the mind, Guru Maharaj. My question is, 
And I don't know if I heard that right. You said the false ego is in the mode of ignorance. The mind is in the mode of goodness. Intelligence in the mode of passion. But uh, in the Gita, and I'm confused whether I understood this right, says the mind is there. Senses are below the mind. Intelligence is higher than the mind. And the false ego is even above that. But here it seems as though it's different when it comes to the modes. No, no, it's just in, there's two different, two different types of evaluations. And you can't put them side by side. They don't work. One is talking from gross to subtle, and the other is just talking about characteristics. That's all. So, yeah, this false ego is the most subtle. Mm -hmm. That's all. So we don't, uh, they are not uh, according to the modes. Uh, it's uh, false ego is in the mode of ignorance. Yeah, yeah, because it's false. It's, it's not, it's anything that describes anything related to you based on the material energy is called false ego. I am man, I'm a woman, I am Indian, I'm old, I'm young, I'm intelligent. These are all symptoms of the false ego. Right. So uh, you also said mind is a mode of goodness. Is that correct? That's in the Bhagavatam in the third canto. You can look it up in, in Kapila Dave's instructions to his mother. He, there's one, the modes of material energy. He talks about the mind, intelligence, the ego. And they explain the mind is in the mode of goodness. Oh, okay. Thank you, Guru. Yeah, the pure mind. <laughs> but when it's led by the false ego, then it gets pulled into the other modes. Yes, good man. Thank you so much for that clarification. You may be a nice person, but if you hang around with somebody who's not so nice and they 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 attract you to go to do something that is not so good, you're victimized. That's how the mind gets victimized. It gets victimized by the by the false ego. False ego is always making plans how to enjoy in this world. That's the false ego. The only thing you can do with the false ego is get rid of it. <laughs> you can't purify it. You can purify it by coming back to our original ego, which our natural ego, which is Jivar Surupai Krishna Das. That all living beings are parts and parcels of Krishna. They are pure spirit souls. Mamai Vamso Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. All living entities are pure spiritual energies and they have nothing to do with anything material. So that is our real and only identity. <laughs> the, all the other identities that we connect with, they're all part of this connection to the material body. That's all. When you have a material body, you have so many designations that come with it. These are all part of the false ego. We are not this body. We are not this mind. You're sitting in your house. You can't say, well, I'm the house. <laughs> or I'm the chair I'm sitting on. No. Thank you, Maharaj, for such in-depth explanation. We have also um, get gratitude from one of the Mataji Kasturi, Harini Mataji. She was saying thanks very much for such information about the mind and all the answers for the question for clarifying her doubts. Thank you, Mataji. Um, is there any questions? I was thinking Indu Mataji, I had seen her raised her hand, but probably she dropped off. Is uh, Hari Priya Mataji, do you have any questions for Maharaj? Yes, please, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Danvat Pranam, Shla Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gurudev Ki Jai. Um, Maharaj, uh, so uh, does it uh, mind intelligent, this subtle, um, uh, so uh, they are mind intelligent and um, 
they are going to um, uh, with Seoul with uh, in Goloka or no? No, you lose. You had the your soul has a has a mind also. Your soul has intelligence. Your soul has senses, but there's pure spiritual senses, pure spiritual mind and intelligence. The soul has a body too. Has a form. And therefore, has so the material mind is simply a covering over the real mind. So it's like a you know if you what we what we can say if you put a glove over a hand, the glove looks like the hand, but it's not. So when you when you become perfect and you go back to the spiritual mind, world, you attain your spiritual senses in mind. Not, not this material one. And their activity is the same as the globe, like, you know, mind. Uh, it's fully Krishna consciousness like that. Uh, how in does it? Yeah, in the spiritual world, everything is fully Krishna conscious. Okay. So you use your mind and intelligence how to serve Krishna in the, material, in the spiritual world. Okay. Thank you, Haribo. Hare Krishna. Is that, is that clear? <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Yeah, I was just uh, confused. Like, you know, um, when you, um, so just transferring the, this, uh, like, we are thinking, we are in the body, so we are thinking we have covering. That's why we, our mind is not that pure. Uh, but it can transfer into purity when we fully serve Krishna. In, in the verse, it says that the mind is not real. It's not real. It's just the material mind is not real. It's just something we have acquired. That's all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Spiritual mind is real. That's that's eternal. And do we experience that spiritual mind in this material world, Maharaj? You can, yeah. When you engage in devotional service, yeah. Thank you. You can, but when you experience it constantly, that is that is the Brahma Bhuta platform or the spiritual platform. Thank you so much, Hari Hare Krishna. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. She is uh, Hari Priya Mataji. Her name is uh, Sheetal, if you remember. She's from Charlotte. Maharaj, when I got initiated by my Gurudev, uh, you and uh, His Holiness Radha Raman Maharaj was there too. Was that in Charlotte? Uh, no, that was in, um, I forgot, um, near Pennsylvania or somewhere. Uh, uh, Harrisburg, I think. Harrisburg, yes. I, I was at your initiation in Harrisburg? Yes, yes. You know the that little uh, temple or church kind of uh, place? Um, there was those that elderly couple there. They were Bengalis. You remember them? They used to be kind of like in charge. What were they yeah, yeah, yes, 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 my what what was their names again? I forgot. My my uh my name is Hari Priya Devi Dasi. Yeah, but those two that couple that was an elderly couple they eventually left and went to Mayapur. Um, oh, I I can ask someone uh, and let you know. I don't remember. Yeah, they, they were the typical Bengali name. What was it? Uh, I can't remember the last name. I don't know. Bhattacharyas, Bhatta yeah. They were called the Bhattacharyas, yeah. Bhattacharya, okay. Okay. Best wishes. That must have been at least 20 years ago, right? No, no, Maharaj. Then uh, it's... Um, 
It's been only three years, Maharaj. Oh, 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 okay. Now I know Anasuya's temple in Harrisburg, yeah. Yeah, I was there and you, you got initiated by video from your spiritual master. He came and spoke. Right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. And now I remember that one. Okay, I was thinking of my old time in Harrisburg 20 years ago. Okay. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj ji are you talking are you talking about Nandulal Bhattacharya and Switri Mata ji Yeah Yeah that's them Nandulal No 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 there was another couple that are much older than Nandulal and Switri they're in Mayapur now too Both of them yeah, but they, yeah, they were, that's a different couple. Okay, many more questions on the subject matter? I think we had another hand up somewhere. Yes, Maharaj, there's, there's a question on the chat by Vivek Prabhuji. He was asking, does mind perceive pain and pleasure? How to beat the mind, Maharaj? And pain and pleasure is simply an illusion because it's part of the body. The soul doesn't feel pain and pleasure, but the body does, but it's an illusion. Just like, you know, if you, uh, if you get an anesthesia, you numb a certain part of the body. And though that body, that part might be being cut, you don't feel it. <laughs> because the anesthesia blocks the sensation. So these are material sensations that come with the, the body because the body is made up of, of elements that are pleasurable and painful. That's all. It's all coming from the mind also. But that's relative. People, people experience pleasure and pain on different, in different ways on different levels. But ultimately, the soul doesn't touch any pain or any pleasure. Wonderful. And what was the last part of the question he asked? Uh, he said, that how to beat the mind? Well, <laughs> this is an interesting question. Because when they asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, I have a pair of shoes here. You come and I'll just beat you with the shoes. <laughs> so <laughs> that was Srila <Hila> Prabhupada. <laughs> but um, that means um, yeah, it's the strongest at the time. I think there is some literal element to that, that you actually have to beat your mind in such a way that it doesn't, you know, it, it, it actually starts to cooperate with you. It's almost like a child, sometimes you have to give them a little punishment. And that's the mind, and especially in the morning, and again, late at night. So um, you might have to think of different ways to keep that mind under control. I think we all experience that when you're trying to chant, sometimes the mind just doesn't want to focus on them. Mantra wants to go somewhere else. So that's the time when you have to really start beating it into submission in some way or another through the power of your chanting or combination of that and learning how to neglect the mind. Thank you, Maharaj. We have a question from Gauri Sevika Mataji. She says that some people remember impressions from their previous lives. Does that get transferred with the help of material mind? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's the material mind that's doing it. Those impressions stay with you life after life. <clears throat> yeah, you have what is called the unconscious part of your mind. And those, those impressions are what's there from previous lives. So they come to the surface in dreams or they can come anytime. There are people who can remember 
there's also a way to know who you were in your last life through some power of um, meditation and hypnosis. <clears throat> so her follow-up question is, does this material mind get renewed with new material body in this material world? It, it gets compounded, not so much renewed. You're just adding to it, that's all. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your answer. Amoldi Prabhuji, would you like to go ahead with your next question? Swamiji, I understood all the point, but uh, I didn't understand one point that how the mind and intelligence remain same after the trans transmigration. Like suppose a uh, human being becomes a dog in the next life, then the mind and intelligence are changed. Na? Both change, they how, how they are same. This, and this, it's, you, you, it's just being used in a different way, that's all. It's the same mind, it's the same intelligence. There's no difference. It's just being used in a different way. Depending on the body, you can access more of the mind and the intelligence. So in a dog's mind, the access is less. In a human mind, human mind the access is more. It's not a different. It's just like if you have a, you know, a basket full of, <laughs> of uh, fruit, you can take one fruit, one piece of fruit out, or you can take many. So for those who have lesser bodies, they're limited in what they can use. Those who have stronger bodies, it's more. So Prabhupada said, you can become a, a dog in your next life. You still have the same mind and you still have the same intelligence. We have the example of Bart Maharaj. When he left his body and thinking about a deer, he became a deer in his next life. But because he was such a great soul, he remembered his previous life and he didn't act like a deer. He knew he was in the body of a deer and he knew who he was in his previous life. And he was associating with uh, sadhus and hearing from them. And that way, when he left his dear body, he became a great soul called Jad Bharat. So, yeah, it's the same mind. It's the same it's intelligence. It, it's, it's just being, it's more powerful or more usable according to the type of body that it's in, that's all. But so many, this example of uh, Bharat Maharaj is exceptional. It can, can't be applied to us because we are not so exalted. That's why yeah, but the example is there. Try to understand the example. That the same example can be understood in a broad sense. That you still have your same mind who you were in your last life. It's not a different mind. And if you become, if you become something else in your next life, you'll have the same mind. Again, Same. the mind doesn't change. It just transmigrates from one body to another. And the impressions, the desires, the, the experiences are simply compounded. That's all. They're not, sometimes they're forgotten. Sometimes they're remembered. That's all. Depending on the power of the experience in the mind. It's not like you get a different mind. You don't get a different mind. The only way you get a different mind is when you leave the material world and you get your spiritual body and then you have your spiritual mind. That's different. The spiritual mind is different from the material mind. As long as you're in this material world, you have the same mind, life after life after life. No matter what species of life you, the body, you know, what the soul is in. It's, it's just the that same. the access of the mind changes. Like dog has less access to the mind and we have more access. Yeah, because of the body, that's all. So Swamiji, our basic goal is to uh, uh, our soul is to revive our soul from the material by using the material body and material intelligence is a proper way. We can revive our original soul, right? The soul doesn't need revival, it needs uncovering, that's all. You uncover yes, yes, it. I meant uncovering. Yes. You uncover it through chanting. You uncover it through scriptural knowledge. You uncover it through service to the Lord and his devotees. You're uncovering your natural, pure, spiritual existence through spiritual activities. Spiritual activities are burning away the coverings of the material energy. 
yes yeah, so we engage our material mind and material uh, intelligence into chanting and then the soul will be uncovered gradually yeah yes yes thank you thank you swami ji very good Thank you, Maharaj. We have an interesting question from Srinivas Prabhu Ji. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. How do we shed our subtle body, which consists of mind, intelligence, and false ego, before entering into the Goloka? How do we shed it before then? Well, that that happens at the time of death. when the consciousness is pure it dissolves the subtle body the subtle body the material the subtle body is simply based on its connection with the material when one reaches pure spiritual consciousness then there's no more subtle body there's no more material body it's consciousness i'll give you an example and this is try to try to see this example the sky think of the sky okay so the sky is vast and big so when you look up in the sky sometimes you see birds you see airplanes clouds maybe other things are in the sky is any of those things touching the sky it looks like it but they're not so the impressions of the mind are like the, the 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 things that you see in the sky and the sky is like the soul the mind does not the impressions of the soul do not touch the mind at all but because from our perspective when you look at the sky you think oh the birds in the sky the clouds in the sky but the sky is not touched by any of these things so in the same way we the material desires and thoughts are superfluous to the pure soul and when you reach perfection then there's no more material consciousness there's no more material body there's no more material mind it's gone dissolved dissipates it's false as paul paul writes in that thing he said although it's it's false the mind is false but it it appears to be very strong the material mind is false mm-hmm. does that make sense shrini shrini vas does that make sense is this the same said, which he said he said What's this Srinivas? What's Srinivas is this? Is this the one from New Jersey or from the one from Texas? No, I'm I'm from India, Maharaj. Oh, another Srinivas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj, for this wonderful answer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, when you reach perfection, every all everything material is gone, destroyed. like when I you think, wake up it's when you wake up from a dream it's all the dream is all gone when you wake up from your material existence you're back in the spiritual world again yes yes maharaj thank you so much maharaj thank you hare krishna hare krishna thank you we had another request from sri devi mata ji she was asking if she could ask another question mata ji you may go ahead thank you uh, guru maharaj in that picture where we saw the five horses the reins the driver etc the soul seems to be just a very passive passenger just dragged everywhere here and there according to the mind intelligence and false ego uh, which seem so powerful compared to that poor passenger sitting in the back seat <laughs> so my my question is is the soul really so helpless and passive no if it connects with krishna it's not if it doesn't it is <laughs> it has to find its connection if it connects with krishna then 
it becomes, it gets the power of Krishna. You can, then it raises itself up and it can overshadow the mind, intelligence, and false ego. But if it, if it connects with any of the other forms of the material body, then it's dragged by that form, that's all. Yeah, make Krishna your charioteer instead of the, uh, between, instead of the material intelligence. <laughs> Such a need for for Krishna, Guru Maharaj. It's uh, so pathetic to imagine a situation like that. You know, drag life after life after life like that from one material situation to another simply because there's no connection with Krishna. It's just uh, horrifying to think what happens to millions and millions of souls like that. Well, oh, this is the material world. The material world is meant to teach you that you that you don't belong here. <laughs> when you finally wake up, you don't you don't belong here. Then you, then you then you start getting serious about getting out. When you think you belong here and you think you can still make plans for happiness here, then then you go deeper into the the cycle of birth and death. My basis is. Thank you don't so much, Guru Maharaj. Don't, don't forget Krishna. The, the, the ultimate principle of bhakti, which is the complete principle of bhakti, is there is two principles. It says that all the rules and regulations in bhakti follow two main principles. And what is that? To always remember Krishna. Never forget Krishna. And this is a verse from the, from the, um, let's see, where is it from? It's from the Mahabharata, but it's mentioned in the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita. Always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. And then there's no problems. <laughs> And everything is nice. Yeah, Hari Priya Mataji raised hand again. Oh, sorry, Maharaj. Just a very uh, silly question because I'm not that in position. But the person who has... Uh, that much, uh, spiritual mind and spiritual intelligence in this uh, in this body, uh, the pure devotee of Krishna, the person you said, Brahma Bhutavasta, do, do they need, um, like, uh, can they live in this body and still uh, they, need, uh, they can be in that uh, position? Do they need a material mind or to do something or? No. Material mind is a covering. It's just a just a shadow. When everything is directed by the soul, when everything is directed by the intelligence, using higher knowledge, then you're on the spiritual platform. Then you're using, and the soul is functioning. The soul, the soul, the connection between the body and the soul is through the intelligence, not through the mind. The Jiva Goswami explains that, that the closest thing to the soul is the intelligence. Well, that intelligence has to be purified by higher knowledge or transcendental knowledge. So just switch your way of thinking from material to spiritual, that's all. And they don't need, they don't need, uh, like, uh, you know, like I am right now, I'm, I'm driving by the material mind and uh, material intelligence and everything material. So uh, I, I'm thinking that, yes, I need this to live, uh, to live in this body, you know, um, I need all this, uh, all the, this junk thing. Um, but 
the brahma bhuta <laughs> like <laughs> brahma <laughs> brahma bhuta vasta like you all do um, all the uh, all the all the acharyas and all you all um you don't need uh, you don't need uh, what we need right to well, leave yeah i don't that idea of you and me is you know you you're making some definition but as long as you as soon as you connect to the spiritual you're you're not functioning on the material you go back and forth between the material and the spiritual so even in the material world we need certain things to live so to take care of the body for the uh, for the uh, pre- preservation of the soul's existence in the in the world there are certain needs that are required so you need food you need rest and if you have family you need certain things in order to maintain the family so these things are are not material because you the devotee you are a devotee and you're trying to become krishna conscious but if you take too much Uh, material things then you then you entangle yourself in the complexities of material energy wasting time with things that you don't need so therefore ishu uh, sri ishupanishad gives us the direction ishavasha midam sarvam yat kanchat jagat tam jagat tena jap tena bundi jaha magudaha kasiswadanam it says everything animate and inanimate animate in this world is owned and controlled by the supreme lord shri krishna and everyone's entitled to their quota so your quota is what you need to keep body and soul together to live in this world and it says if you live according to your needs then you can aspire to live for hundreds of years that's the next verse so that's that's our concern not to take too much or to take too little of the material in order to maintain our existence thank you so much thank you hari krishna sari bol okay did we end did we get through the questions or there's more Okay, thank Arch in the city, my obeisances, Hare Krishna, all glories to Prabhupada. <laughs> okay, I guess we can. Yeah, it's. Uh, we can stop here now. Yeah, we can stop now. Thank you so much. Okay, Bye. thank you very Bye. much. My obeisances thank to everyone. And you can all look forward to, to the upcoming verses. Uh, this first one is a real light verse and the next the next the next three verses are really really heavy verses on the mind so i think you'll find it much inter- much much more interesting as you go on it's really really because the mind is a, you know the mind can take you to heaven or it could take you to hell so, the, so you're at, so this is a very important topic to to explore deeper and deeper thank you very much guru maharaj hari krishna thank you okay lalita tangi lalita dina bandu shamagori who else do we have there we got two thank you maharaj yeah. thank you guru maharaj such a fantastic class maharaj and every word you spoke was so clear crystal clear and we need to hear it again. and again and the question answers were so enlightening uh, thanks to all the devotees and thanks to you maharaj for dispelling our illusion and by your example you are showing us the how to control the mind thank you so much hari krishna yeah i'm also trying i'm also trying to learn uh, at the same time <laughs> it's not a, it's not such an easy business but we can talk about it <laughs> I will see you again very soon so my obeisances to all the devotees